something that doesn't look okay if I take pictures. I'm never sure, and then I see him do it, and I'm like, heck yeah, I'm gonna do this. <laughs> so we did that side last time, right? No. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, everybody make crazy faces. <laughs> okay, thanks. So now, let's talk about service workers. I am Carmen Borland. I'm from Oklahoma City. I am a full stack developer there. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, I tweet a lot, so fair warning. I also blog at carmelu.com. I blog about offline because offline is my jam. And also, Margie Map is a map I've been working on. It is actually kind of related to this talk. Internet access is tied to income. And so what this map is doing is it's taking census data, specifically income, it's plotting it on a map, and it's looking at the surrounding libraries, because libraries are a place that people can go and get access to the internet. So please check it out. I think it is super cool. The data is very interesting. So before I try to sell you on service workers, I think we should talk about the problem the service workers are solving, because if you have access to the internet all the time, you might be like, oh, what do I even need these for? So has anybody ever seen this guy? Oh, yeah. So if you're really good at the game, that's probably not good, right? <laughs> that means you don't have internet, and that's not good. Which brings me to my main point. Internet connection is fickle. It can fail in any place. There's so many different stops along the way. It can be your modem or your hardware. It can be your ISP. If you are the biz side of it, it could be the cloud service provider, because does anybody run their own servers? Uh, I, we're on AWS, so yeah. If AWS goes down, uh, it's all looking good. Point here, nothing in that is within our control, right? Like, I have Cox Internet at my house in Oklahoma City. I can't call them up and be like, hey, can you guys like speed that up? I really need this internet back. It's outside of any one person's control. Additionally, it is never at a good time, right? Like nobody's ever like, oh yeah, this is a great time to not be working. Or maybe you are, I don't know. <laughs> but it's, it's typically, it always feels like it's at the worst time. So service workers can help. If you're not familiar with service workers, what they do is they cache files and assets. The data from those, so that's any static files, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, images, anything along those lines, and that is cached on the end user's machine. So what this means is that if your internet drops, if your modem is down, or the cloud service provider is down, or your ISP is overloaded, any of those scenarios, your user can still get to your app with or without the connection. And even cooler than that, if you're not too worried, like maybe your users have a really great connection because they're corporate, I don't know. But if you're not worried about that, the other thing it does is it will increase your app's performance. I just read this really interesting article that was talking about a e-commerce site that went to Progressive Web and they increased their conversions by something like 20%. That's crazy. 20%, that's huge. So it increases the speed of your app, it increases performance overall, they're very good. So, if you're not sold, I'm going to give you a few more things. Service workers provide consistency for your user. We were just talking about, you no longer need that network connection anymore. They're always going to get to your app every time. And everybody's going to lose connection. Has anybody in here watched Aaron before? Nobody's raising your hand. Somebody's lying. Okay, yeah, everybody has, right? And so there's really rare where there's a technology that we can implement that's going to impact every single user in a positive way. But this is one of them. So seriously, they're very cool. Check them out. And I mentioned before my map project. There are people who cannot access the internet due to income. Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because we've got a whole ton of content to go over, but 12% of adults in the United States are smartphone dependent. What does that mean? It can mean that they don't have access to internet within their home due to income. 
It can mean that they live in an area where they are not close to a library or a Starbucks or an IHOP or a place that provides Wi-Fi. They can't get there or the place just isn't there because of where they live. Last thing, it can mean both of those things. I don't know, oh, there it goes. It can mean both of those things. They don't have internet access at home and they don't have a public place they can go to access the internet. And so what this means is anytime they want to do anything, they have to do it from their phone. They don't have internet access. And honestly, internet access in these days is opportunity access. So it's really important that we you know, try to help. Uh, a couple predictors of smartphone dependence. I have a Pew Research study linked in this repository. Uh, that's where I got all this data from, but these are the top three predictors that that study found. Income. If your income is less than $30,000, you're more likely to not have internet access within your home. If you are between the ages of 18 and 29, which I think for a lot of people just so happens to be college age. Can you imagine going to college these days without having access to the internet? It would be very hard. And then lastly is ethnicity. Uh, Latinos and African Americans are far less likely to have access to the internet within their home. So. All that said, service workers can help solve this problem. Like, I just, I think it's really, really cool that there's something that we as web developers can do that will have a direct impact on this issue. And there is, it's service workers. So, just a really quick recap. We're not worried about network connection anymore because we're not going over the network. We're going to speed up our apps, again, because we're not going over the network. And if I haven't sold you yet, seriously, service workers are really cool. So, a quick note before we jump into any actual code for service workers. Service workers follow the same origin policy. So what that means, if you're not familiar, is that if I have a service worker, say on my blog at carmelu.com, facebook.com cannot get into my service worker and mess with it, make any changes, get into the files, nothing like that which is really good because I don't know if you guys have been following Facebook lately, but I don't want to know my stuff. <laughs> Next thing is service workers, according to the spec, can only run over HTTPS. This is another security issue, or not issue really, it's solving the issue. Uh, there is one exception, because what is a rule without an exception? We can run them locally on localhost, but that is the only place you can run them over HTTP. It's nice because Personally, I don't want to have to worry about making an SSL certificate just so I can do some development. That sounds terrible. So, if you're not familiar with the support, it's looking pretty good now. Uh, earlier this year, Mobile Safari just introduced service workers into their browser. Um, oh, yeah! Yeah! That was really exciting, right? I was super stoked. Um, so yeah, we've got pretty solid support now. And we're still going to want to use feature detection, right? Because people are still using IE. It's going to be a while before that finally falls off. But So use our feature detection. But as a whole, people are going to be able to get really direct benefit from implementing these. So service worker life cycle. If you're not familiar with the service worker life cycle, it's pretty simple, actually. So first thing, somebody gets to your website for the very first time, they don't have a service worker. So it's going to download. Once it's downloaded, that's going to trigger the install event. When that's completed, it's going to activate. Activate sounds like it's going to really do something. Actually, at that point, it kind of just hangs out in the background. It's not really doing anything until there's a fetch event. So let's take a look. Service workers are typically in their own file. Like They're their own kind of thing. They're running in the background. They're not really interacting with your application at all. This is really the only place where you're going to reference your service worker within your application. So we register it from our app's JavaScript file. It, again, remember I was talking about that feature detection. It's really important. We want to do that. And then we just register it. Pretty simple. That's going to trigger the uninstall event. So that's right here. In the service worker, we're going to listen for different events, the first of which is this uninstall. So this looks like a lot, but let's break it down. What we're really doing here after we name our cache is within that caches.open, what that does is it either opens an existing cache, or if the cache does not exist, it will create it and then open it for us. That returns a promise with a reference to the cache we just opened. 
We're going to use add all to put any files we want to save into our cache. That will accept an array of strings, as you can see. Those are just like file names, basically. Uh, the first one, you might be thinking it's not a file name. If you don't specify that slash, I learned this the hard way, so take it from me. Go ahead and do that. Um, if you don't specify that slash, what's going to happen is, so my blog is another example. If you go to karmaloo.com, it's not going to work without that slash. You're going to have to go to karmaloo.com slash index.html for the service worker to take effect. So basically what that's saying is take effect at the root of the application. After we add those, that returns a promise. We can do any error handling. You see we got some catches in there, and that's really about it. So you can see, implementing a service worker, I, I've talked to some people who are intimidated, is really not, it's really not too much. Uh, this is our activate event. Uh, I mentioned that when it activates, like it doesn't necessarily do anything at that point, so I'm not really doing anything there other than like some logging and some error handling in case it didn't activate. So this is where we start doing things. So I mentioned before the life cycle is download, install, activate, and then kind of wait. So kind of waiting in the wings for a fetch event. If you're not familiar with fetch, it's kind of the next iteration of Ajax calls. Uh, quick note, if you're not using fetch, your service worker isn't going to work. Service workers are, they are integrated with the fetch API, they get these events whenever a fetch call is made. If you're doing Ajax, you're never going to, these events are never going to be triggered. So, within this, what we're doing is we have that respond with function. So, that is specific to service workers. Basically, that's like a return statement. It's saying, whenever the function between those parentheses resolves, that's what I'm going to get back to the browser. That's what I'm going to respond with. We have to use respond with instead of return because kind of the way your service worker works is it hears an event, it wakes up, executes the function, and it goes right back to sleep. So what it respond with is doing is it's keeping your service worker awake long enough to actually give back whatever the function results with. So within this particular function, what we're doing is we're opening up our cache and we're saying, hey, are there any files that match what the user asked me for? If there are, it's going to find them with that match function. And then if, if they're there, it's going to be returned in that promise. If they're there, we go ahead and we just respond with those. If they're not, we're going to go ahead and go over the network, right? Because we don't want to not give the user back the files that they're asking for. A couple quick notes. We've been talking about cache a lot. Uh, service workers themselves are not cache storage. Cache storage is separate, but we're able to use the cache API within a service worker to access cache storage. Caches, like service workers, are tied to an origin. The browser is going to check every 24 hours to see if your service worker is updated. And if it has, it's going to pull it down, and it's going to trigger the download, on install, it's going to do all of that again. So it's, it ignores the time to live that your JavaScript files will probably have. So, anybody want to see it? Yeah. All right. Okay, so this is just a simple, can you guys see that? This is just a simple documentation site. This is an API that I made for a women's group that I help run. And we're gonna pop up that, well maybe we are. There we go. So what I wanna show you is actually in the network tab. Let's refresh. So what we have here is the app. And you can see, well maybe you can, it's giving us a 200 okay, but it's designating that that came back from the service worker. So it's not actually going over the network because it's already cached on my machine. And if you go to fapi.herokuapp.com, you will also get a service worker installed on your machine. So if I go ahead, this is dangerous, but if I turn off the Wi-Fi and I refresh, it's still there. And it's still coming from the service worker, even though on the console, it's saying, hey, your internet's disconnected. So they're pretty cool, they're very powerful, very helpful for people with intermittent connection, which is basically everybody. 
but wait, we can do more. So it is really great for when somebody loses internet connection, right? Especially if, say, you were traveling yesterday like I was, and you're in the airport, and your connection is like in and out, and you have a documentation page like that. And you're like, well, I can still at least, you know, work on stuff locally. But I don't know if it's so good, right, if, say, you are an e-commerce website, and your users are, you know, making requests, they're buying things. It doesn't really help you in that way. So it would be really cool if we could store off outgoing requests. And it would be even cooler if once the connection returned, we could go ahead and send those requests. Is anybody in here interested in anything like this? Yeah. yeah. So you probably guessed with all of my leading up to this that that's what we're gonna do next. And we're gonna do it with background sync. So this is kind of a, this is the lag cycle of a request before we implement background sync. As long as we have connection, everybody's happy, they hit submit, it goes to the server, it works great, but then if it doesn't work, everybody's sad, and they get the dinosaur. So I think it's a funny gift. <laughs> this is after background sync. Real quick, I want to note, you'll notice that between step one and step two, there is a database. Background sync on its own cannot store off the data from the requests that we're making. So if you're passing any data in with the body, you have to you have to store that off in IndexedDB or another, well, really it needs to be IndexedDB because local storage doesn't work within a service worker. But what we're gonna do now is first the person hits the button to send the request. It gets cached in the database, IndexedDB, and then the service worker takes over. It goes ahead and it tries to make the request, and if the internet is available, the request goes through just like normal, it's no big deal. If the internet is not available, the request won't be made. What will happen is the service worker is going to say, eh, we don't have connection right now, I'm gonna try again when we do have connection. So, pretty cool, right? There's a little bit more going on in our register function in our index file this time. And that's just because we have to trigger a sync event whenever we click the button. So let's look at this together. We're still doing our feature detection and we're still registering our service worker. In that second then, we have a reference to the registration, which is where we're gonna get the sync functionality. So you notice that if statement, it says registration.sync. If we don't have that, we don't wanna do anything, obviously, because feature detection. So, we're going to add in that if statement an event listener on our submit button that registers a sync. So that is this right here. And we're gonna name it, and so we're gonna have that name within our event listener, I'm gonna show you in just a second. So it looks like a lot of code, but when we break it down, it's really not too much. And then this, within our service worker, is actually quite small. It's a sync event that we're listening for, and then we have the name from, so remember before, we gave the button a name, well, we gave the sync event a name. That's how we're gonna know which button triggered which sync event, is by that tag. And so within that if statement, we're using wait and tell. That is another service worker specific function that keeps the service worker awake until the function within those parentheses resolves. So in this case, it's saying go ahead and send it to the server. Again, if we have connection, it's gonna go, it's not gonna be a problem, works just like normal. If it doesn't have connection, it's going to wait and reattempt when connection is regained. And you can see we're not having to really do anything to make that happen. We're just saying, hey, listen for this sync event, the service worker itself is doing the rest. So there's a lot of red on that graphic, right? Feature detection is really, really, really important if you're gonna use something besides just like a regular service worker to cache. You're gonna use background sync or push or the other features of service workers. It's so, so, so important that we're using that feature detection. That said, I wouldn't say not to use it because with feature detection, even if it doesn't, even if the feature's not included, everything is still gonna work and uh, Mobile Safari just implemented service workers earlier this year. These other features, they are on the way. They are going to be here. So don't let this stop you from going ahead and using these really wonderful features. So, let me see if I can ironically get my Wi-Fi back. 
Funny story. This doesn't have search order. Well, it does, but uh, it's not caching the files. So, okay. So the scenario here is that, say, you're signing up for a mailing list, and your user clicks submit, and they put the phone back in their pocket, and they're like, I'm good. I did that. Check that off my list. So what we're gonna do is we're going to put in some information. You guys only thought you were gonna get my email. Okay, so we put in that information, and now I'm gonna turn the Wi-Fi off again. So when we click submit, watch what happens. We have a log statement down here that says the sync was registered. But if we pop over to the network tab, there was no request made. That's because there's no Wi-Fi. The service worker sync was checking for that. And we didn't have to do anything to set that up other than trigger that sync event on the submit button. So if I turn the Wi-Fi back on, when the Wi-Fi comes back, we're gonna see. Also, um, real quick note, oh, I'm gonna do it. Might be a little slow. There it goes. So it did the sync, and then if we look over in the network, see, it went ahead and it made that request, and we got our response back. So how cool is that? The Wi-Fi went out, it came back, we didn't really have to do very much other than just trigger that sync event, and service workers were providing the rest of that for us. So that's super cool. So, I promise I'm not trying to sell you guys anything. There's even more that service workers can do. Uh, it would be very cool if we could send a user a message. Maybe you guys don't think it would be cool. Some people get really annoyed by that box that's like, hey, can we send you messages? But I'm going to show you guys how to do that anyway. So it would be cool if we could message a user even if they weren't on our web page. Or maybe they wouldn't think it would be cool. Again, use this with discretion. So you probably guessed it from all the build up. We're going to do that. We're going to use Web push or the push API to do exactly that. So I want to say here that up to now, the stuff I've been showing you has been pretty, I, I think, relatively simple to install and set up and all that. There is quite a bit more going on with the push API than any of the stuff I've shown you thus far. So keep that in mind when I show you these next examples. Unlike service workers in background sync, Push requires that we get permission from the user. You do not have to get permission from the user if you just want to cache their files or take advantage of background sync. You can do that, no permission required. Push is not that same way, and that's because we're sending them messages whatever page they're on, and that could be really annoying. So we want to make sure that the user understands that and they explicitly give permission. Once we have that permission, assuming we have that permission, we're going to create a subscription. I'm going to show you guys how to do that. Once we've generated the subscription, we're going to save that off somewhere. Um, Firebase has a really good way to handle for this. You can make your own. That's what I did in the example I'm going to show you guys. But that subscription has to be saved off somewhere for us to be able to access it. As when we're generating that subscription, we get an endpoint. It's some JSON, and it has an endpoint. That endpoint is what we're going to post to in this slide. Once we want to send out a push notification, we're going to go to our server that has the list of our subscriptions, and we're going to make a post to each endpoint as a part of that record. And then the push service, that's not us at this point. The browser provides the push service. So Chrome has a push service, Firefox has a push service. The browsers provide that push service. We're going to make a post to their push service, which is then kind of where we just like let it go. We make the post and then we don't really have to do very much after that. Their push service is gonna wake up the service worker on the person's machine and that service worker is gonna show the notification and handle for whatever happens next. So I know I just threw a whole bunch of stuff at you guys. Let's take a look. So this is a part of our register function. Remember back 
at the very beginning that you're registering a service worker in the index file. This makes a couple of assumptions. Firstly, most importantly, the system that the user has given us permission. You're never going to fall into this if statement if the user doesn't give you permission. So we're using feature detection again to make sure that we have access to push. We're using that subscribe function to generate our subscription. We're passing in that object. And then that returns a promise that has a reference to the subscription. And then we're just saving that off. That's what that fetch function is doing right there. We're whatever, wherever we are saving that, that's what we're doing right there. And we're passing in the body. Pretty simple. So we're kind of missing a piece here. And if you are interested in that, I definitely recommend checking out the repository that these slides are in that has a link to the demo project that I'm going to show you. But this is what the service worker is going to handle for it. Making the post to that push service is in the repository. This is what the service worker has. So service worker hears that push event, which the browser triggered when we made a post to their push service. And then we get all the data back. So the data that we're going to show the user comes back as a part of that event. We're grabbing that right there. And we are creating the options for the notifications. So that's like the title and whatever information we want it to include. And then we use wait and tell to tell the service worker to stay awake until the notification has been shown. And we pass in the title and then whatever options. We can also handle for what happens if the user clicks on the notification. So that's this notification on click function. That's an event that gets called whenever the user clicks on it. What we're doing in this case is we are closing the notification window, this is a little box, and then we're saying, go ahead and open a new window and go to this website. Push support is a little bit better than um, background sync, but not quite as good as service workers, so still be using that, be using the feature protection. And let's check out the demo. Okay, so this is a silly little thing that I made. I'm a big fan of countdown timers. I don't know why I love them so much, but I love them. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to post to an endpoint on a database that I provided. So remember I mentioned that we're saving off the subscriptions in our own database. I'm making a post to that database. I'm going to click send, and what's going to happen, depending on our internet, is we should get a notification. So it's loading. And I'll, I'll note right here that even if we weren't on this particular website, the notification would still pop up. This is taking so long, I don't want to show you guys that. But weird. So that is push notifications. And that brings me to my next thing. You might be wondering what Thunderplanes Conference is. Thunderplanes Conference is a JavaScript conference in Oklahoma City where I'm from. We are still accepting submissions on our CFP. So that's cfp.techlahoma.org. It is open as an office site, so I know that there's some fabulous ideas in this room, and we want to hear about them. There's going to be awesome content, there's going to be awesome people. Also, I will be there. So definitely, it comes with you guys. Definitely, <laughs> definitely come check it out. And I mentioned the repository that these slides are in. It has a references file, so if you want to read up more on service workers, it has references. It also has links to all of the demos I showed you if you want to check those out. And that is actually all I have today, so thank you so much.